They attacked by air, land and sea, taking Israel by surprise during a major Jewish holiday. Now, 13 and a half hours after Hamas launched its audacious assault, Israel says it's at war and Palestinians are already paying a heavy price. Airstrikes raining down on Gaza and a warning that electricity supplies to the Strip will be cut. The attack began at daybreak with thousands of rockets fired from Gaza hitting Ashkelon, Beersheba and as far away as Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. At the same time, dozens of Hamas fighters crossed the heavily fortified border in at least seven places. They infiltrated Sterot and other southern towns and villages, gunning down civilians, torching homes and taking hostages, including in the Ofakim and Beri kibbutzes. Since then, the Israeli Defence Force has been engaged in gun battles with Hamas in numerous locations. And it's been hitting back hard, bombing Hamas targets, high-rise buildings and health facilities in the densely populated Gaza Strip, which is just 16 square miles and home to 2.3 million Palestinians. Kira Moodley reports on the day's developments. And just to warn you, you may find some of the images distressing. An astonishing new image that turns this decades-old conflict around. Palestinians atop a captured tank in Gaza. A coordinated and unexpected attack, a breach in Israel's security that it appears they simply didn't see coming. Street battles inside Israeli towns, a stunning failure for the state. Their retaliation only just beginning in Gaza, the full consequences still unknown. In the early hours, they came by land, sea and air. All this footage from Hamas itself, as it triumphantly declared the start of Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. The flood began with a stream of rockets. The militant group fired more than 2,000 from Gaza into Israel. Smoke billowed in cities such as Rehovot and Ashkelon on this Saturday of Simchat Torah. Israeli security taken off guard by this attack on a Jewish holiday. At around six in the morning, a rocket fell near the house and everything burned. The house destroyed, the windows, the walls. We heard a massive shock. Our child was startled. I don't know. We live in a reality that is not real. We've decided enough is enough, said Hamas's military commander, as they broke through the Gaza fence. This unprecedented attack was an apparent Israeli security failure akin to 50 years ago at the start of the Yom Kippur War. But that conflict was on land in Sinai and Golan. This was terror and death on Israelis' doorsteps. Militants riding through the city of Sterot as Hamas began taking control in Israel's south. Unprecedented large-scale incursions onto Israeli territory. One of the deadliest days in its 75-year history. With citizens told to remain inside, through the slats of their blinds, they witnessed the unimaginable. Israeli police fighting to get back inside their own station. Hours later, the Prime Minister convened his security cabinet. All eyes on a man leading the country's most right-wing government who promised to put national security first, but who has instead focused on his political problems at home. Since this morning, the state of Israel has been at war. Our first objective is to clear out enemy forces that infiltrated and restore the security and quiet to the communities that have been attacked. The second objective is to exact an immense price from the enemy. The Israeli Defense Forces soon launched Operation Iron Swords, targeting Hamas militants and with heavy airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. And they released a video showing their soldiers preparing for mobilization. A military operation now on either side. Code words for all-out war, the number of dead rising throughout the day. Some in Gaza were well aware of the wrath heading their way and had already fled to shelters. Of course we are in fear. We're afraid of what they will do. The Israelis might wipe us off the face of the earth. Some did not flee, but celebrated. Since Hamas took control of the Gaza Strip 16 years ago, 
A blockade by the Israeli government has been described as creating a prison on this small parcel of land. Palestinians jubilantly paraded captured Israeli army vehicles, machines which had earlier been manned by soldiers, some having had their lifeless bodies dragged out. Elsewhere, Hamas claimed to have taken a number of Israeli captives, some civilian hostages, others soldiers as prisoners of war. In total, enough for them, they claim, to swap for all the Palestinian prisoners currently in Israeli jails. Over in the occupied West Bank, they chanted a bullet for a bullet and fire for fire, we have risen. It was here in places like Jenin, where Israel's military raided the refugee camp three months ago, causing widespread rioting, that many thought the tensions would boil over. Not in Gaza. Some did throw stones at Israeli soldiers, small skirmishes. But Hamas this evening said their operation may have started in Gaza, but it will expand to the West Bank. The militant group continues to release footage of their attacks. They say they are still engaged in battles in 25 locations in Israel. And the Israelis continue to pummel the Gaza Strip, with Netanyahu telling US President Joe Biden that a forceful, prolonged campaign, which Israel will win, is necessary. This is just the first 12 hours. Well, earlier I spoke to Hamas spokesman Ghazi Hamad and asked about his group's attacks against Israeli citizens, which have been described as unprovoked. Look, uh, I think we as a Palestinians, we are fighters for freedom, for dignity and for prosperity. So we are fighting for, for the future of our people. It is enough for us as a Palestinian to live under under occupation for 75 years. And it is a time now for the inter international community to understand that the source of all evils and pains and tragedy is occupation. I think we need all the international community to help us to end this occupation and to give the Palestinians to establish their state. So I think all the time we are paying a price. So I'm not afraid from Israel. Now they are now in Gaza, they are killing, they are destroying, destroying buildings and towers and destroy the infrastructure, the electricity, everything they just... You now have a situation where Palestinian gunmen are apparently roaming the streets, killing civilians, taking people hostage, ordinary civilians hostage. There's no justification for that, is there? Look, I think all people now look at that for the civilians, of the, the, the Israeli civilians, and they don't take care about the Palestinian civilians. Now, today, today, this until this uh, evening, we have about 20, 100, uh, 200 people were killed in Gaza. 99% of them are civilian children and women. And uh, in the last 10 years, more than 10,000 people, uh, Palestinians, were killed here in Gaza. And most of them are civilians. But, but do I you think, make a uh, distinction the... between killing Israeli <laughs> military figures and civilians? Do you make that distinction? Look, we are, we are by to the Islam ethics and morals. And we we were we were never uh, thinking to to attack the civilians, but I think it is open confrontation now. I, I think, but I think we have a strong commands in order to avoid the civilians. Our our fight is with the soldiers and settlers, and uh, against the occupation. This is our goal, and this is our aim. But you so say you act are, within the uh, laws. You say you act within the laws of Islam, but there's nothing that justifies the killing of civilians, which we've seen in the last 24 hours by Hamas and by Palestinian militants. Look, I think I, so we are we are very we are very careful. We are very very uh, specific in this way. As I told you, we are doing very hard to avoid the civilians. But I think, as I told you, it is an open. A war, confrontation, conflict. It is not easy to uh, do everything 100%. But I, as I told you, we are a bite to the but it's not, uh, ethics. You say you're being careful, but there's civilians being mown down at a bus stop, being killed, shot at at a bus stop. That's not careful, but, is but it? You don't, you don't take care about the, the Palestinian civilians in Gaza Strip and West Bank who are killed every day in the, the West Bank and Jerusalem and Gaza. No one take care, take care about the Palestinians. No one take care every day that, you know that since the beginning of this year, about 233 Palestinians were killed in the West Bank. It's almost exactly half a century since the Yom Kippur War. 
Is that timing significant, symbolic to you? I think it is now today that the world should understand very well that the international community should understand they have to put in for the occupation. Second, listen, that Israel should not, that are not free to do everything against the population, that as a Palestinians, we have the power to stop this, to make kind of deterrence and to stop the crime of Israel. Finally, are you prepared now for a very long war? I think all that our life is suffering. It is, it is suffering and suffering and suffering. So I think we prepare also ourselves to fight against occupation. But maybe this is, I don't know, this uh, round of confrontation or conflict will last for some days. I, I don't know. It depends on the situation on the ground. Ghazi Hamad, thank you very much for joining us. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht is a spokesman for the Israeli army. I spoke to him earlier and asked what shape he expects this war to take. So we have an unprecedented event, Kathy, uh, that happened this morning uh, where Hamas basically unleashed a combined offensive on Israel with a massive salvo of rockets and also a ground incursion invasion to Israel. So this is something which is unprecedented. They came in not focusing on military targets. They moved into the communities surrounding the Gaza Strip, uh, targeting families, grandmothers, children, a nature party that was happening uh, near Gaza. So we are planning our response, but our first stage right now, uh, as we speak, we're still fighting. Our first stage is to restore security in these 22 locations, and then we'll plan our future uh, response towards Gaza, and it is going to be severe. Well, do you expect that severe response, as you put it, to include sending troops into Gaza? Our focus is now restoring security. There's people now in siege in these uh, communities, families, children, grandmothers. Uh, and I can confirm that we have also had people abducted. So just again, the mindset of people coming through the fence, capturing a grandmother, take her in, taking her into the Gaza Strip, uh, people from a party. Uh, so we have some uh, hostages, uh, we have some casualties, and it's been a very, very severe and hard day. Hamas says that they've got enough Israeli captives, as they put it, to force you to free all Palestinian prisoners in, uh, in, in your jails. I mean, is a prisoner exchange possible to liberate these hostages? Is that something you consider you have in the past? We are not uh, talking about that right now. We are, that's still we talked about probably the future. Right now, we're focusing on a real war that's going on right now in the South. You talked about grandmothers being taken. Must Gazan civilians, Gazan grandmothers and children now, in reprisal, endure a hail of missiles from Israel? Kathy, this is not the story. If, if Gaza was quiet, uh, we wouldn't have gone or uh, done what we're doing. We do not focus our uh, attacks on, uh, you know, people that are not involved, uh, on uh, civilians. We will be going after Hamas targets. They're responsible for this event. Hopefully, the collateral damage will be minimal, but we will respond severely. Well, how can the collateral damage, as you put it, be minimal when Gaza is so congested? There's so many people, more than two million people, living in a tiny space. You can't distinguish between civilians and military targets there, can you? I think that's not the story right now. Right now, there's Israelis. There's Israel is now under attack. Israel, they started. If they didn't start it, if they've been quiet, I mean, just a few weeks ago, uh, there was more workers coming into Israel. There was a great bathing season in Gaza this year. Things were getting better. Well, if, it's a very simple equation. They started. They attacked Israel in a very severe way, Kath. But do you regret that inevitably civilians in Gaza will now suffer terribly as a result? Sadly, the civil we're not fighting against the civilians of Gaza. In uh, contrary to the Hamas, who are fighting against any Israeli civilian, they'll kill any Jew they can. Uh, contrary to that, we will be focusing on targets, and if there's uninvolved people killed, that will be tragic. But again, we will respond severely to this horrible attack. Tragic, but unavoidable. Yes. Thousands of rockets were, were fired um, from Gaza. How was that possible, and how many actually got through the Iron Dome uh, missile defence system? So approximately 3,000 uh, rockets have been fired into Israel. It might be a bit less, it might be a bit more. 
And the Iron Dome have been standing pretty well. Um, there was there was one hit this morning in Ashkelon. I'm sure there's a few more. I'm an old air defense guy. You know, there's, we always say that's not there's never an hermetic defense. They're always trying to saturate our defense systems. Uh, there was actually one hit in Tel Aviv, but it wasn't from a rocket. It was from after an intercept. It was some debris that fell down from uh, the interception. So again, it's, it's a challenging uh, dynamic too for our air defense uh, community. So did you ever think you'd live to see an attack of this nature on so many different fronts? It's a very challenging day, a very severe day, Cathy, but we will overcome. Well, I trust the long... military. Go, go on. I'm, I'm hoping that by the end of this day, we'll have control back in all these communities. And, and again, then... it's been a very, a very hard price. But, and then, as the Prime Minister has made clear, a, a war, a retaliatory war will follow. How long do you anticipate that continuing for? Hard to say. As long as needed. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Cathy. Well, the unprecedented operation by Hamas comes at a time of turmoil in Israel. It's hardline government under intense pressure from pro-democracy protesters. There's also growing despair among Palestinians in a year of rampant settlement expansion, flare-ups over a holy site in Jerusalem, and 200 killed in Israeli raids in the West Bank. The peace process is effectively over, and many of their allies are normalising relations with Israel. Porok O'Brien looks at the backdrop to today's events. If war begets war, it feels like it's spawning at an alarmingly bloody rate across the globe. Today's attack on Israel, though, both a long time coming and in a form no one was expecting. Especially, it would appear, Israel itself. So, how did we get here? Yesterday, the burial procession of a 19-year-old Palestinian on the West Bank, that, as is often the case, morphed into violent protest. Not counting today's bloodshed, nearly 200 Palestinians have been killed in fighting this year, the highest death toll in almost two decades. Some 30 people have been killed in Palestinian attacks on Israel. The suppression of Palestinians, the violent backlash against Israel, is the cauldron in which extremists on both sides stirred up the conditions that led to today. The domestic players include hardliners who've occupied the Israeli government and a hollowed-out Palestinian authority. Then the regional actors likely involved in today's attack. I think the result of what we're seeing unfold in Israel is very much a coordinated uh, attack by Hamas with the help of Iran and Hezbollah. I think I don't have the intelligence to, to, to say that, but my analysis is that this required months of planning and definite support from either Iran or Hezbollah or both. In a statement, Hezbollah said it is in, quote, direct contact with the leadership of the Palestinian resistance and praised Hamas's attack as, quote, a decisive response to Israel's continued occupation and a message to those seeking normalization with Israel. Here's what they're referring to. The blessing of a new Middle East between Israel, Saudi Arabia and our other neighbors. Prime Minister Netanyahu heralding the possibility of normalized relations with Saudi Arabia at the UN recently, something Iran and Hezbollah see as, among other things, a betrayal of the Palestinian cause. So much of how the region responds will be down to the ferocity of Israel's reaction. And is there a world in which this could be the start of a series of united, coordinated attacks by Israel's enemies? The Iranians and, the, and Hezbollah are going to be very wary about opening another front that risks um, seeing massive Israeli retaliation against what is, in essence, the back office for now for the Palestinians operating in, in, in Gaza. Proxies are always players in this part of the world. But there is nothing proxy about the people who will suffer the most in whatever it is to come. Well, joining me now to discuss all this further is our international editor, Lindsay Hilson. Lindsay, the words unprecedented have been used from both sides. Um, is that the case? This is unparalleled for various reasons. Or can you draw 
comparisons with previous conflicts? Well, I think if you compare it with, for example, 2021, there was a 10-day battle, if you can call it that, or clash between Hamas and the Israelis. In those days, the Hamas fired 4,300 rockets. Already more than 3,000 have been fired from the Gaza Strip into Israel in one day. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows you that this Hamas attack is on a much a greater scale than we've seen before. And this level of coordination by Hamas, that the way they've, they've managed to get in, to infiltrate, they've taken 54 hostages. This is unprecedented. And some of those hostages have been taken back to Gaza. Now, you know, in the past, you had... Gilad Shalit, one soldier who was taken hostage, and that took years for the Israelis to negotiate his release. Mm -hmm. And now if we're talking about, we don't know how many are in, in Gaza. So that, again, is unprecedented. And also the way this has taken Israel by surprise, what was going on? There are some reports that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu had put too many soldiers up towards the West Bank, where there have been a lot of problems recently, and taken the eye off the ball in the south. But that is also unprecedented, something so big, which the Israelis just didn't see coming. And you talk about the hostages being taken back to Gaza. Might that affect the Israeli response, do you think? Well, definitely. What Hamas is saying is that the hostages are being held in their tunnels in other facilities. Now, obviously, the Israelis do know where some Hamas facilities are and they want to bomb those facilities. But if those facilities have got Israeli um, civilians or soldiers, then obviously that makes a difference, which is why the hostages were taken in the first place, mm. as well as in order to try and swap them for Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Yeah. But from what we've seen already, we've seen that the Israelis are mercilessly bombing Gaza. And, you know, this is desperate. Already 200 Palestinian um, civilians and citizens killed and 150 Israelis. This, again, is a much higher death toll on the Israeli side than we've seen before. So, briefly, what now? Well, I think that two countries have the possibility of negotiating. That's Qatar and Turkey. The uh, Hamas do talk to those countries. But there is no direct line between Hamas and Israel. And the Palestinian leadership is sclerotic, it's weak, it has no legitimacy, there are no peace talks. It's very hard to see how this comes to an end quickly and how such a mediation could take place in the next few days. Lindsay, thanks very much for joining us with that analysis. Well, Gaza has been under bombardment all day, leaving its residents fearful about what the night ahead will bring. This was the scene just a short while ago as more airstrikes light up the sky. Targets have included high-rise buildings housing families, as well as offices used by Hamas. One strike came as I spoke to Gaza-based activist and journalist Noor Swerky just shortly before we came on air and I asked her to describe the situation right now in her neighbourhood. So the situation is very terrifying, in fact, now, because it's uh, almost 12 hours uh, since the uh, attack, or whatever its name, uh, started uh, this uh, early morning at 6.25 a.m. So it was uh, like a surprisingly happening, uh, and we were in uh, completely shock. I assume you haven't tried to go out in that situation, but are you hearing constant missile strikes? For sure, yes. I didn't need to try because I have kids, so I have to keep them uh, safe. Uh, I, I, at some points, I feel a panic that all, is, uh, all of uh, this is happening there and uh, uh, everyone here in Gaza is waiting for his uh, destiny, maybe, uh, if he will stay alive or not. The Israelis say, you know, this was an unprovoked attack. I know Hamas says there has been plenty of provocation. But do you fear now that ordinary Gazans are going to pay the price for potentially Hamas overreaching themselves? Well, in fact, it's not about Hamas itself. It's about the, also the Israeli side. That it, I, I believe this is a kind of reaction about what has been happening uh, in, in, in the last 10 years, maybe. Not only in, in the last year or in uh, the, the, the most recent time, or month or... Sorry. It's OK. Was that a, was that a missile strike? Yes, yes. Okay, I can. So we can't hear it here. Now. Describe what just happened to us, if you can. 
So it's a kind of movement, not sure if it's from our side or the, or the Israeli side, but I believe from the sound, it's an Israeli airstrike mm. for some uh, place maybe, or a building or whatever. We will wait for the news to know where. Yeah. Because uh, you were very, all the way through this interview, you've been very calm and, you know, very composed. And when you paused there, I could see the, the terror in your face. Yeah. It's a terrifying, a terrifying situation, not only for me, it's for any human being yeah, to be under, uh, under fire mm. uh, and uh, to, to watch his destiny by himself yeah, or herself, yeah, uh, to wait for maybe to die or not to die. This is the situation here for the Gazans, in fact, yeah. We have a daily life in, in, uh, before this day, but uh, we know at some point and suddenly we'll face the death again because some of the, uh, the, the both sides of the, the conflict will do something to, to break again. I mean, yeah. you're caught, you've described very well how you're caught, um, but do you find it in your heart to sympathise with the Israeli civilians who are, you know, have been captured, kidnapped, they're terrified, they've lost their relatives, their friends? Do you feel solidarity with them indeed? It's not about empathy or solidarity, it's about the humanity, in fact, yeah. So we, we are all human beings, uh, and at the end of the, the, of the day, yeah, we are all human beings. But uh, the, the engagement with the civilians uh, should be uh, respected with these rules, mm. and, uh, and this is what should be happened. Norswerki, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you.